City Council study session for November 8th, 2021. The first order of business this evening will be electing a chair. I say John Perkins. Second. Are there any objections? Okay, Councilman Perkins. Well, good evening, uh, Council. As has been our custom for the last several years, um, city staff has been working the past few months to develop what we believe would be an appropriate legislative agenda um, heading into the January uh, session that will start in Jefferson City. Um, but prior to adopting that, we always like to review that with the City Council and get your feedback. So this evening, um, John Mayfield, who does handle our legislative affairs and coordination um, from the city staff standpoint, is here to make that presentation and get any feedback you all want. Um, I will mention that um, after this presentation, we will schedule this resolution for final consideration before the council, uh, probably at that first meeting in December. So without further ado, I'll ask Mr. Mayfield to come make that presentation. Good evening, acting chair, members of the council. How are you? Councilmember DeLucy, it's so good to see you. I'm so old fashioned, I never know what to do up here because I just have notes, but uh, we'll see how I do and hopefully I don't mess up your presentation, Mr. City Manager. I wanna give you a, kind of a few dates to keep in mind. The City Manager kind of went over some of them, but uh, legislators may begin pre-filing bills on December the 1st. So after a couple of weeks of that, we will probably have a pretty good idea of kind of what they're thinking, maybe what the hot topics are gonna be going into the 2022 uh, session of the General Assembly. It will begin on Wednesday, January the 5th. It concludes on Friday, May 13th. Um, a lot of politics involved this year. Filing for congressional state offices will begin on Tuesday, February 22nd, and conclude on Tuesday, March 29th. And as the city manager uh, mentioned, it's our anticipation of having a resolution for you on the December 6th uh, council agenda. We anticipate playing a lot of defense in 2022. Some of that is because we had a fairly successful 2021. So in life, you always have a lot of ups and downs. So when you have some success, it's kind of tends to reason that you're gonna have some uh, setbacks possibly. So, but I think one word could really describe why we're gonna be on defense in 2022, and that word is politics. The announced retirement of Senator Roy Blunt has created a domino effect across the Missouri political landscape. Currently, we have two members of the Missouri congressional delegation that have announced their candidacies for that seat. A third member of the Missouri Congressional Delegation is thinking about running for the United States Senate. So when you have two or possibly three congressional seats open, and as we have the, is the case right now, there are several state representatives and state senators who've either announced that they're gonna run for those open congressional seats or they're contemplating a run. So when you have a lot of seats kind of in motion, so to speak, kind of musical chairs, tends to create a little bit of friction. We had a lot of tension in the Missouri General Assembly toward the end of the year, especially in the Missouri Senate. And those tensions kind of erupted again in veto session in September. So when you add in people running for higher office and you have a lot of high tension that hasn't been resolved, it's gonna be really difficult to get a lot of things passed. Um, and secondly, the governor nor the General Assembly decided to call a special session to deal with redistricting. So they're gonna start dealing with it in January and most observers think that's going to take at least a month or longer before they settle that out. And then the Missouri House, after that happens, they will more than likely turn their attention to the 2023 state fiscal budget. That's a lengthy process they have to involve and it starts in the House, ends up in the Senate and then they kind of have conference committees and duke it out and fight out the state budget. So that's gonna be you know, quite a roller coaster in 2022. And so our motto basically is let us keep what we have because with a lot of people running for higher office, they're gonna have a lot of, you know, slogans and bill titles gonna sound very popular until you get into the details and realize it's not really as good as it sounds. So here are our top four uh, legislative uh, priorities proposed for the next session. First, the city opposes any changes to economic development tools mainly community improvement districts. In the last couple of years, there have been 
several bills to have really would have hampered our ability to have a community improvement district. And we feel like that maybe some of our legislators were worried about transparency issues, but you might remember in 2019 that the council created the Independence Economic Development and Incentives Commission, the EDIC, to provide transparency and accountability. And we feel like if other communities would model what we did, that there wouldn't be any need for these bills that deal with community improvement districts. So we really want to keep things just the way they are. We're not really asking for a whole lot in 2022. We just want to keep what we have. Secondly, the city opposes any reductions, caps, or altering of the local sales tax rate. I know many of you uh, attend the Finance and Audit Committee meetings and understand that sales tax has kind of generally, for the most part, has been flat for the last several years. And there have been several bills proposed in the last several years that would cap or somehow alter the local sales tax rate. Now, I, we don't have any control over what they may or may not do with the state sales tax rate. We just want them to leave ours alone and let those who are closer to the people decide. Hancock says that we have to take issues to the voters if we want to have any kind of change in the sales tax rate. And I just don't understand how you could do that, have a cap or some kind of alteration without the voters weighing in directly as Hancock calls for. So we want to keep the sales tax, you know, you know, pretty much where it is, have the options available to you because if there are cuts in the sales tax rate, it may force you into difficult decisions about services that our citizens have come to know and expect and appreciate. And you've all had several different difficult budgets to deal with over the last several years. Now we kind of add fuel to the fire and we really want to avoid situations like that if we can. Third, the city supports any federal or state solutions and resources to address blight one of these would be the Motor Carrier Safety Assistance Program. It's kind of a two-pronged uh, issue. The federal government funds it. MoDOT and Highway Patrol sort of run it, so they both kind of have to be in agreement that we can have one. And you might know that, remember that uh, there's a landfill just outside the city limits of Independence that brings a lot of trash and debris in, and we also have other commercial vehicles that come through town. We have 99 miles of uh, roads and highways to patrol for our Police Department, and having that tool would be very helpful for us to kind of keep the city a little more, you know, a little more clean, more beautiful, and kind of let folks know you, know, you can't just come into town and not play by the rules. That's all we want, people to play by the rules. And so that's the third thing. And then finally, we support local control of rights of way and public assets. And basically what that means, we currently have a truce with the telecom companies, the small cell phone companies. Uh, with their uh, equipment and so forth. And I know that Tom Robbins came about a year ago and kind of explained it in much better detail than I could for you uh, about how the bill that was passed in 2018 gives us the second highest uh, poll attachment fees in, this, in the country, kind of allows us to tell telecom companies if they you know, damage something, especially in the public right of way, that they can come back and fix it at their cost, not our cost. So. Those are four of the things that we're kind of looking at next year. Now, there, that doesn't necessarily mean that there may not be items or opportunities that we can go on offense and maybe ask for some things. We'll kind of know more after the pre-filing period, kind of see where everybody is kind of leaning. I have kind of shared a rough draft of this uh, agenda with both our lobbying firms. and They both feel like it's a, 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 a policy they can get behind and support us because we're kind of playing defense. Now, there'll be a lot of other cities and local governments as well in the same boat, uh, trying to just let us keep what we have. We're not going to ask for a whole lot more. Just let us keep what we have in 2022. And so that is kind of a quick summary of uh, the 2022 proposed state legislative agenda. Uh, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Any questions or comments? My only question, John, home, homelessness. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on or maybe Somebody in Jeff City's thinking about it. Could you just investigate for us to see what we're going to be dealing with? We might get some help. You never know. Well, they're, they're spending a lot of money in Washington, D.C. these days. Maybe there's some financial solutions there, but we can definitely uh, talk to the Department of Health and Senior Services and uh, Highway Patrol and, and local groups here. It's just one of those big issues there's just not a cookie-cutter answer for, unfortunately, that... There's, there's a lot of dynamics to it, but I'll be more than happy to bring up a lobbying firms and some state agencies and see what we can come up with. That would be great. Thank you so much. Sure. 
not hear anything further, Mr. Mayfield. So we have two great lobbyist teams that can really help us do things down there. And it's not so much that uh, what they can bring to us, the lobbyists, is what they can stop down there that can just make us just as much importance as money they bring to us. Both of these firms have stopped a lot of bad bills over the last four or five years that would have cost the city, and I'm not exaggerating, tens of millions of dollars. I mean, I know you face difficult budget situations year after year. Without these firms, uh, I can testify to you that your situation would be a whole lot worse without them. Absolutely. So thank you tonight for your presentation. Thank you. That brings us, brings us to the next one. It's the city manager's presentation of the city of independence revenue comparison to surrounding cities. Mr. City Manager. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, council. Uh, Councilmember Perkins, thanks for filling in tonight. I know the, the mayor's taking a well-deserved break tonight, so you all get to hear me talk about revenues tonight. So I um, want to start by reminding the council why we talk about this. Um, the strategic plan that you adopted five years ago and that you renewed earlier this year has as one of its four cornerstones financial sustainability, making sure we build into the organization that long-term financial stability. And it's critical because all of the other goals that you've identified cannot be addressed unless we have that financial sustainability and the means by which to fund the activities necessary to achieve your other goals. So tonight, um, this is a follow-up to a couple of presentations that we've made to you since you adopted the budget back in June. Um, you may recall that earlier this year, we discussed with you the budget constraint analysis presentation in August. Um, that presentation, which I'll quickly some, um, give you a refresher on in a moment, looked at how our expenditures were truly constrained, thus the name, um, based on different requirements from our charter, from state law, from voter approval to different sales taxes, et cetera. And that begat the question from the council of, okay, if we understand our expenditures and how they're restricted, then where are we at on revenues? And I've heard this from each of you to a person ask me, how come I go to fill in the blank city and they look so much different than us? How come the streets are smoother? How come the grass is you know, kept maintained better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think the question that we received as staff, what we heard you saying is, benchmark our revenues to these other cities and let's see, is there something about that side of the equation that is putting us in a different position than what we see from the expenditure side of things? So we're gonna talk about that a little bit and then you know, a few thoughts on additional revenue resources that may be uh, meritorious for further consideration. Just that quick recap of the budget constraint analysis, I won't go through this um, painstakingly, but as you will recall, as you move from top to bottom on this list, each of these restrictions are, um, you're moving from most restrictive in your enterprise activities down to your least restrictive, which would be your flexible funds. Flexible, of course, is a bit of a misnomer because unless you're willing to cut from things like municipal services, like community development, these aren't truly flexible funds, but these are the ones that you have the decisions and the ability to somewhat easily move funds around um, from year to year. That, of course, we identified for you is only 6.7 of your $337 million budget. So really, you've only got about $6.7 million year to year um, that you can play with, or that, I mean, by play with, I mean reallocate and move around. So let's start talking about those revenues a little bit. Um, and be, by doing so, let's look at some of the um, cities that are nearby um, and, and that we may consider our peers. We looked at cities of varying sizes and really what I asked our staff to do, and, and by the way, credit to Erica Benitez, our budget manager, who did the painstaking uh, resource on uh, research on this and, and helped us um, arrive at these conclusions. But as you'll see here, um, you're looking at total budget for each of these um, cities. Uh, Independence there at $337 million. Um, we're second uh, only um, to Kansas City, who's at $1.73 billion. Of course, half a million people in an airport, you'd expect them to be larger. Um, but a couple of things I want to point out here. Residents per FTE, the column that is furthest to the right uh, on your screen and on your presentation, <coughs> Uh, Independence has one employee for every 102 residents in this city. Um, 
the only other city that had a lower ratio on our list was Kansas City, who had one for every 69 citizens. That is a bit of a misnomer, though. Um, and why that's a bit of a misnomer, take Blue Springs, for example, who has one for every 174. Well, Blue Springs doesn't have a fire department. They're serviced by Central Jackson County Fire Protection District. Blue Springs doesn't have a full-fledged water treatment uh, operation. They buy their water wholesale from the City of Independence, who has the employees to treat that. Blue Springs does not have an electric utility. Um, they're serviced by Evergy. Blue Springs doesn't have a full-blown wastewater treatment operation. They maintain the sewer lines, but all of their sewage flows to um, the Atherton uh, Little Blue Valley Sewer District for treatment. So as you start to back some of those things out, you can tell Independence residents actually don't have nearly as many FTEs per citizen as some of these other cities do. Okay, so let's start talking about how we compare from a tax perspective with some of these other cities. Um, starting with sales tax, independence, our city sales tax rate is, um, well, prior to last Tuesday, 2.25%. Um, that will change now with the approval of the fire safety sales tax increase. Uh, but at the time that we made this presentation, that's where we stood. Um, the average comparison among the cities that are listed on the screen was 2.85%. So first conclusion there, our sales tax rate is lower than our peer cities. That's one area that we're lagging behind them. Um, use tax, because use tax is a product of your sales tax rate, it is simply capturing the online portion. Um, we are lower than the average rate there too. Um, Blue Springs and Raytown, at the time of this presentation, did not have a use tax. Raytown voters approved theirs last Tuesday. Blue Springs has still not but the average use tax rate was 2.96%, or of course at 2.25. Real estate tax. Our real estate tax is um, 61 cents per um, AV on this. The average for comparison cities is a little over a dollar, 1.03. So our real estate taxes are lower in what we're bringing in. Now here's the truly interesting one, personal property tax. That mistake is not a, uh, that dash is not a mistake, I should say. We have no personal property tax. Very quick history lesson. October 9th, 1973, the citizens of Independence approved a 1% local option sales tax in exchange for repealing the personal property tax. It was a great idea at the time. And then they invented the internet. God bless you, Al Gore. Um, now we have all of these internet sales taxes which have depleted our brick and mortar sales and personal property taxes continue to grow in annual valuation, we are not capturing that. So you can see that the average city is getting almost 75 cents um, in personal property tax collection. We're a goose egg on that. So 0 for 4 at the plate here. We lag in every single one of these behind peer cities. Um, you're going to hear me say this a few times tonight. Our problem here in the city, I believe, is no longer an expenditure problem. It is a revenue problem. Let's talk about some of the general fund resources, though, zooming in on the general fund. Um, independence, our general fund, is made up primarily of payment in lieu of taxes, sales taxes, franchise fees, and property taxes. Um, when we looked at the comparison cities, most of those were similar in that. All of those, of course, experiencing some of the same challenges we are. Notable decreases, for example, in franchise fees as people decrease their cable usage and opt for streaming services. Um, landlines going down um, and opting for cellular service. So they're all experiencing the same things we are from that regard. A notable exception when it comes to general fund revenues, Kansas City, Missouri, if you live or work in that city, you pay the 1% earnings tax on your gross annual salary. That comprises 42% of Kansas City's general fund budget, nearly half. I should probably not say never, but I'm fairly certain independents will never have an earnings tax. A few years ago, Missouri voters approved that if you did not have an earnings tax in your city, you cannot pursue an earnings tax for your city. And Kansas City has to run theirs every five years to decide if they wish to retain it. Um, so unless the state legislature were to repeal that and independents voters were to vote that in, um, this isn't gonna be an option for us, but I did wanna highlight um, one of the disparities there. Um, we took a look um, at um, charges for services. So, you know, if you come and do businesses with the city, um, the charges for services, things like 
getting a permit, having a plan reviewed, uh, things of getting a copy of a, a record from the clerk, things of that nature. Um, Kansas City and Lee Summit, they receive significant revenues from this. This is also a, a big revenue source for them. Um, I will tell you though, our fees for services appear to be much lower. For, end, uh, for Lee Summit, that appears to be about $9 million per year. We're bringing in about $1.9 million per year from this. So we are either charging much less or have far less volume for service, but some combination of that means we are recouping far less in our fees for service than uh, our neighbor to the south. I wanna show you a different look at the general fund. Uh, when you take a look at the general fund compared to the total budget, for our average city uh, that we compared against, their general fund budget was 34.5% of their total city budget. For us, that number is 23%. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, of course, we have three major full-fledged utilities here, so that distorts the picture for us when you have an electric, water, and sewer utility. It dwarfs the amount of your general fund budget but it also highlights the need for additional revenue growth. Again, the general fund portion of our budget is about 15% you know, less than what our peer cities is. Again, we either need more people paying into the system or find ways to generate new revenue sources into the city. I wanna talk also here about personnel expenses as a portion of the general fund. Um, what I find interesting here, if you look at the bottom, the average comparison city, 67% of their total employee population is in the general fund, okay? 68% of their budget in the general fund is comprised of personnel expenditures. So pretty close there, right? 67% of the employees in there, 68% is uh, personnel expenditures. Jump up to independence. 55% of our employees, total employee population is budgeted in the general fund, but 85% of our general fund budget goes to personnel. We are overextended on the salaries and benefits that we afford here in the city. And this is why we have this conversation every year about how do we partner with Stay Well, how do we partner with our collective bargaining units to try to have sustainable salaries and benefits um, while still remaining a competitive employer. Um, but you can see that disparity uh, in black and white right here. When you look at the typical services supported by the general fund um, across the peer cities, really nothing groundbreaking there. Um, pretty consistent in that it supports general administration, police, fire, community development, municipal court, and public works. Um, when we looked at those internal service funds, so for example, when you charge for things like fleet maintenance or for fuel for city vehicles or for uh, workers' compensation, those kind of internal service charges, um, not all cities uh, use this um, model. Some use uh, cost allocation, which is a chargeback method. Um, so we kind of found some interesting things I think we can uh, further research and vet um, and maybe find some opportunities to figure out best practices with our budget. Um, but that is also something we have to be mindful of because of the additional burden that places back on the utilities as well. So we'll want to be careful how we navigate that, but um, I think there are some opportunities with our uh, internal service funds. Okay, and as we start to wrap this up, um, one of the big things that also stood out to us when we were benchmarking revenues against other cities was the use of general obligation bonds. And quickly, for those who may not be familiar, a general obligation bond is a municipal bond that's backed by the credit of the city um, where they issue debt and then over time that debt is paid off through um, property taxes paid by owners of property here within the city. Um, I've gotten the question before about why in the world would we do that. Um, the best answer I can think to give you is that if I use taxpayer money today to buy a pencil, that pencil will last, you know, not my entire career, but a portion of my career right there. If we pay, however, to replace a bridge, ideally that bridge should last for quite a long time. And people may move in and they move out of the city. 
So in order to have that intergenerational equity, of, you know, if you're using the bridge, you pay for the bridge, that is why we typically look at using geo bonds to pay for infrastructure. The people who are using it in the present tense are the ones who are paying for the ongoing costs associated with having that infrastructure, that road, that bridge, et cetera. Um, you can tell by, uh, by the way, in case anybody didn't know, and I'm sorry for the assumption, Independence presently does not have general obligation bond debt. We have made use of that in the past, um, but presently, that's for, for a general fund perspective, we, we don't have that. Um, other peer cities do. Um, that could be as small as Liberty, um, which has about 16.8 uh, million in general obligation bond outstanding all the way up to Kansas City, who in 2017, voters approved an $800 million general obligation bond issue for sidewalks and roads and bridges and animal shelter and all sorts of things that they are going to use over the next 20 years to improve and modernize the infrastructure in their city. So again, this is a conversation that the council may wish to consider, but it's something that we wanted to bring to your attention that other cities are using as part of their business practice. Um, our enterprise funds, electric, sewer, water, and our special revenue funds, which is our sales tax funds, voter-approved sales tax funds, um, a lot of cities have these charges, of course, even though like they're wholesale customers of us or they're using the Little Blue Valley Sewer District, they still charge their users for the systems. So they have the special revenue funds, um, but they're much smaller portion of their budget. So I just want to make sure that I highlighted that. All the other cities have at least one voter approved sales tax that they're making utilization of. Um, so we're not unique in that at all as well. So I'm going to wrap up um, a couple key points that I wanna leave you with here tonight. Um, we've done a lot of work, as you know, over the last five years, um, finding those opportunities to reduce our expenditures, to find efficiencies, to find innovative and creative ways to deliver our services but I do believe we're at the end of the rope on that. We've negotiated a very creative and very helpful uh, uh, retiree health insurance plan with Mr. Sorensen and the retirees. Um, we've um, consolidated departments, we've combined departments, we've eliminated certain services within the city that we felt were redundant or that we you know, weren't taking full advantage of. I, really am at a loss at the other things that we could be doing at this point short of simply stopping doing certain services in this city or reducing them in a way that will be noticeable and detrimental to the public. And I don't say that to be alarmist, I simply have an obligation to be transparent about that. So I believe it's incredibly important that we start to identify either additional users into the system, meaning people who live or work here who can pay sales tax and utility fees and things of that nature, or find new revenues that can support our operations here in the city. Um, there's a list on the screen, you can see that. We have all of these budget pressures that continue um, to nip at our heels. We're not alone in this, but we're alone in the limited resources that we have to try to uh, address these things. Um, I will leave you with reiterating my point. I, I'm at a point where I do not believe we have an expenditure problem. I believe we have a revenue issue. And as we start the budget process, which starts tomorrow, there's a meeting on my calendar for budget prep tomorrow, um, we've really got to take a look at long-term revenue growth in order to sustain the services that the citizens and the council expect of us. <clears throat> so with that, I will conclude my presentation and answer any questions you have. Any questions, any questions or comments for the city manager? Absolutely, Mr. Uh, Perkins, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Walker, um, <clears throat> the difference between us and Blue Springs and Lee Summit and Liberty and most of those places other than, well, even KC now, is that uh, we own all our own utilities. Did you look at comparisons taking our utilities out of it? Did you look at that? We don't have that on the screen here, um, but yes, we did that. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying this facetiously. I thought this was depressing enough. Um, if you back those out, the picture looks even more bleak for us. Like for example, when I was showing you the FTEs Correct. per one employee or the portion of our budget, when you, when you take those things out, 
Um, our, our general fund budget is um, much smaller as a portion of our overall budget compared to those other cities. Well, and I appreciate that. And we have a lot of positive things happening, thanks in, in large part to your hard work and community members and the council and all that, of course. Um, and there, I think there is some hopefulness going forward, especially with some of the money that we've gotten to invest into our community, thanks to the federal dollars we've re received in the last year. Uh, but we're on the verge of looking at an RFP at some point next year for possibly, you know, indebting the city for up to a hundred million dollars for new generation at IPL. And I don't think we're, it seems to me what you're saying is, and it seems to be common sense that we are not in a position to just sort of spin the wheel and see what happens. Yeah, our, our margin of error is much lower than what the peer cities. Um, a year ago, uh, when we were in the throes of the early, early throes of the pandemic, um, the council will recall that you know, we had a general fund fund balance of around 8%. Our peer cities were you know, at least 25%, if not higher. Um, so our margin of error is much smaller um, than those other cities. We can't just take a spin at the wheel to use your analogy there. Well, and I'm not making light of it, of no, course. Not at all. I'm, but we need to have concrete numbers, uh, you know, going forward on. So however bad it looks, maybe you can email, email that to us, or if you don't want to release it, I guess that's fine too. No, but it's fine to do I, so. I'm happy I, to, to and, and we'll also make sure that's shared with the, the public online as well. No, I appreciate that. I, we just, you know, um, I agree with that. We've cut as much as we can. Uh, as you've mentioned, we're lagging behind. There are some revenue side things we can do. But on in that same vein, we need to make sure our enterprise, our enterprises, our utilities are profitable uh, or at least breaking even. You know, the charter has that magic language in a business-like fashion. Um, well, actual businesses make money. If you're not making money, you're not a business. You're just an incinerator. So. Yeah, and to, to your point, council member, to echo that, I, I agree. And you'll recall the presentation you heard from IPL director Jim Nail a few weeks ago where he mentioned that to make it, profitable, we were going to have to significantly, substantially increase the number of residential customers or industrial customers that, you know, status quo was, was not going to um, make things look different out there. I've, I've bothered uh, our finance director along the way, and is there any way we can even get like a, you know, just like a corporations do, can we get like a quarterly P&L for all the different utilities. The, the numbers may be there, but putting it in a form that's easy to understand. Yeah, let me work with the finance team and the utilities and see what we can put together for you. I mean, I, I'd really like to see some of that going forward because uh, again, $100 million uh, would be the biggest project independence would have done in my lifetime, so. Certainly. You know. Uh, if we really are going that route, then it, we, it all needs to be all but guaranteed that it's gonna pay for itself and maybe then some. Correct. So, okay. Um, do you have in mind uh, some ideas of what we would use if we did a geo bond, what we'd, we would, if you're talking infrastructure, would that be your thought? Yes. Um, and, and let me answer that in just a little bit of a roundabout way, if you don't mind. A few years ago, we provided the council with a deferred maintenance report. So what that was, was a list of all the projects that we knew needed to be done, but we did not have funding for to include in our five-year capital improvements plan. Um, at the time, that included the construction of a new power plant. So the number was right at a billion dollars of deferred maintenance, okay? Um, now, 
I think we have set our foot, um, at least for today, on a different path, so that number would be much lower, but still, um, the cost of maintaining our historic sites, bringing those up to where they need to be, all right? So like I was talking to um, one of the volunteers at the Vale Mansion last week, pieces of that building are starting to fall off of it, all right? It's beyond just cosmetic nice-to-dos, it's that that asset is failing and starting to crumble. Um, the Frontier Trails Museum, with its large crack right. in that um, eastern wall that needs to be addressed. I mean, and that's just to fix, that's not to make the museum more modern or appealing or anything like that, that's just to stabilize it. Um, the number of times I've gone out into the older part of our city, of pointing at Councilmember Perkins, the northwest part, which was annexed into the city, and stormwater drainage issues up there, because we did not put, you know, that area did not develop with modern day um, sanitary sewer issues uh, or stormwater issues. I think you have a few of those in your district as well, council member. Yeah. Um, the sidewalks are always an important issue for our citizenry. Um, too many times I think we all see people walking along the shoulder of the road or in the road because there's not a sidewalk in that area. Um, and we've heard about it, you know, I know there's a sidewalk project that's being um, moved forward right now for Castle Park, but for too long we heard um, from that neighborhood about the safety issues over there. So this isn't the glamorous, you know, no, no offense to my neighbors to the west, but you know, we're not talking about building an animal shelter here. We're talking about basic quality of life things um, that help people get to work, get to a park, stay healthy, move around, et cetera. And also investing in the historic sites that are completely unique to every other city but us. And I believe we have a fundamental responsibility to maintain and tell that story. Would would or could some of a geo bond be used in any way to accommodate or help manage homeless issues? Or is it really just strictly? I'm most familiar with general obligation bonds being used for a tangible okay. brick and mortar gotcha. product okay. um, and not for operational services. Very good. I, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? I Council thank you. Lucy? Don't leave yet. I have a couple questions. Just a uh, just point of information. The Audit and Finance Committee mem uh, members are myself, Councilwoman DeLucy, who chairs it, and also Councilmember Hobart. So we kind of go over a lot of these different mm -hmm. revenues discussions and stuff like that on a regular basis. So thank you for bringing that uh, to our attention. Um, so Lee Summit, talking about the general obligation bonds, Lee Summit used theirs very specifically and decisively, um, at least a strong portion of it for economic development of their downtown, which helps spur their growth and they're also um, their revenue coming into them. Is that is that something that is possible to be used here? Could we say half for capital improvements and then half for economic development? Yes, because what Lee Summit used theirs for was a lot of the infrastructure down there, um, fixing the sidewalks and making those, you know, instead of just a traditional sidewalk, the decorative pavers, the landscaping that you see down there, um, the, 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 diff, the, the, the streets, um, their city hall was a part of that project as well, that, that and the police headquarters and the parking garage, so that campus, that government campus that anchors that, I guess would be eastern end of the downtown. Um, um, some decorative fencing, things of that nature. So yes, geo bonds could be used to help with um, the infrastructure component of the economic development as well. They were very decisive, and as you see, they blossomed quite well, and they're still developing there from that initial um, geo bond, which helped see some of that development, but they're moving moving very well. Um, economic development, that's something that we're looking at tomorrow, tomorrow, next Monday, we'll be voting on the Cargo Largo, um, which is a significant uh, financial gain for the city to do that. So as we keep moving forward, working with our EDC, looking at how we can do things different and develop the EDC different. Um, the presentation, the study session that was given by Mr. Maurer about a month ago, kind of laid out the, the path and the, the avenues that we should move 
hopefully to do things different and make that attraction to independents. When, I'm glad you mentioned Cargo Largo. When, you, when I talk about bringing new users into the system, that's the kind of thing I have in mind. In addition to seeing you know, more houses built, um, more single family occupied homes, things of that nature, um, that project is going to be a, a major economic boon. The sales tax revenue that the city is going to generate over on that is, is going to be monumental and a game changer for our community. But I need more of those, multiply that um, to continue to have the resources necessary to cover our city. Absolutely. Anything else, Mr. City Manager? You, you were mentioning, I, when you were talking about downtown, I do, I think, a good connector for people. Um, my favorite part of the examiner every week is the days gone by section. Um, I can't wait to find out what happened with that Panther a hundred years ago. Um, <laughs> but the 50 years ago section this past Saturday mentioned approval by the voters of a general obligation bond to construct the police station that's over there. So that is but another example of the type of project that in the past our voters have utilized this tool uh, to make a transformational difference for the community. Good point. Anything else? Could we, hmm? yeah, real quick, could we, um, so we could use a geo bond, assuming we could borrow enough to build a, a Justice Center, or a City Hall, new police station, jail, all that kind of stuff? Correct. Correct. Um, okay. State statute is very specific about um, when you can go to voters for that issue and the amount of approval that has to be obtained by voters but that would be an allowable use, yes. Do we have any prior studies or anything we've done along those lines? Yeah, we, we are rich in studies, I, and I say that seriously. That's why, that's yeah. why I asked you, because <laughs> I was sure there was yeah. one or five or ten. Yeah, we're really good at studying. Yeah, okay, yeah. very good, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Yep. You're, you're just fine. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. <clears throat> Moving on. Number three, back to the basics monthly program update. Yeah, I'm going to ask assistant to the city manager, Sam Morris, to start making her way up, but a quick introduction that I, I won't give after tonight on this topic. Um, when you hired me five years ago, it was made very clear that one of the primary things you wanted us to focus on was basic service delivery. Um, in order to do that, we've been trying to modernize our processes and our systems um, upgrading, you know, things like CityWorks, upgrading things like our um, app, uh, in-depth now. These are all things that you've heard before. Um, we are at a point now where I believe we can publicly step out um, and report on how that's going. Um, I want our community to be able to engage us um, in a way where they can let us know the issues they have um, at a way and a time that's convenient for them have a reliable mechanism to follow up on those requests for service, um, and then you as a council to see how well or how not so well we are doing in delivering on those service requests. We are talking about limited revenue just a moment ago um, and not having the you know, margin of error. We need to strategically deploy our resources to where and how those service requests are coming in. We finally, I believe, have the technology and the ability to do that that's what this Back to Basics program is about, and that's what Sam Morris is going to present on to you right now. Wow, that's Mr. a good Sam setup. Manager. Should have let him do it. No. Mr. Chairman, members of the council, my name is Sam Morris from the city manager's office. I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and present to you tonight uh, in conjunction with Mr. Walker's presentation on financial uh, sustainability. I'm here tonight to speak on um, the customer service that, that we focus on within our strategic plan. Uh, if you guys recall, within our council retreat in 2021, uh, we discussed our citizens' um, survey that we received back from them with what their top five priorities would be, as well as your vision for what those priorities would be. And we determined that moving forward in 2021, our top five priorities were going to be reducing crime and disorder, enhancing our public health, reducing blight, stabilizing and revitalizing our neighborhoods, and being able to communicate more effectively both internally and externally. So in doing so, um, our city manager called a staff meeting for our office to look at these uh, priorities, but also identify the targets within our strategic plan as to how these fall in. He gave us a challenge to critically take an inward look at the services that we were providing our citizens and how we could best serve them and improve in some areas. 
In doing so, within our strategic plan, uh, we pulled out some of our uh, targets that we wanted to focus on, and that was implementing a better process that tracks and responds to our citizens' concerns. Uh, all of our frontline employees complete a customer service training. We will use social media to better communicate with all of our citizens and use new methods and technology to reach all internal and external audiences. So with our top five priorities that you presented to us in early of 21, along with these targets, uh, it's important to look at what we've done. And in doing so, we've implemented this back to basics idea that Mr. City Manager presented to you earlier. Uh, we, we needed to, Mr. Walker challenged us uh, to go back and, and identify why it is that we get up every day and come to work. What is it, what are our focus? Um, and that is to be able to serve the citizens of independence to the best of our ability. And in doing so, he challenged us to this back to basics vision, and this is what we have implemented so far. So we're gonna provide four different options for reporting our concerns. Uh, we very quickly learned that it is important to meet our citizens where they are at, and there are some citizens who prefer to be able to make uh, and voice those concerns in person uh, mm -hmm. or over the phone. In doing so, we were able to uh, move some of our current employees around to create a community affairs executive assistant that is able to do that. They're able to call or they're able to come up to City Hall and make those concerns and complaints with her. We also launched our app in uh, er, March of 2020. We currently have approximately 3,300 users that have downloaded this app, and we're seeing on average approximately 100 new users every month. We uh, updated our website to be able to take complaints of all kinds, not just specific to certain departments. And last but not least, we created an internal email address that if you receive a constituent concern through, you're able to send it to this internal email. And that is managed by five uh, different city employees that will, based off of the complaint, determine what department it needs to uh, be assigned to and will do so. The next uh, biggest challenge that we had was our citizens were letting us know that they did not want to be bounced back and forth between different departments. So what we did was we implemented the system where regardless of what department this citizen has called, they will be able to take that complaint, enter it into the system, and assign it to the appropriate department. So no more uh, you know, phone tagging back and forth to try and, and find the appropriate person. And as soon as I set that concern into the system, it notifies the person that it's been assigned to, uh, and it gives them an email almost instantly, um, letting them know the finite details of it. Who, who made the complaint? Where was the complaint? What is the complaint? Uh, are we providing any photos on that complaint to give us a better idea as to what's going on before we send our staff out on scene? We also, with the system, um, have the ability, again, to be able to upload photos. We're able to track these better. We're able to provide comments throughout the entire process to our citizens, whether it be in the beginning, the middle, or the end, it doesn't matter. Uh, we can provide our citizens um, updates as to what we're doing with these cases. And when staff closes a case, we are now um, sending an automatic notice to the citizen, letting them know the status of it. Uh, was it an ongoing project? Is it a duplication? And please refer to this particular case report number. Is it uh, a, a, a bigger project that maybe we have as uh, an ongoing project for several years and we need to let them know what the status is? It also utilizes statistics to be able to produce reports and improve um, the services to, to our community. All right, so as you can see, um, there is a tremendous amount of data that we're able to extract from this new system. Uh, we, during the time frame, unfortunately, these, uh, this data is a little dated, um, but for 10-1 through 10-22, we had 576 new service requests that come in. So to put that into perspective for you, that's approximately 36 brand new complaints every single day, and our average codes um, shift is approximately eight hours so we're looking at four and a half complaints every single day. Um, I'm sorry, four and a half complaints per hour. I apologize, four and a half complaints per hour. So as you can see, um, we have a tremendous amount of concerns and complaints coming in on a daily basis. 
We have approximately 57% of them coming through our neighborhood services department. As you see, they're represented by both the green and the gold on the right-hand side. Also within this report, it allows us to be able to look at the top five problems within the provided date. So we're able to see that during, again, this provided time of 10-1 to 10-22, we have uh, 103 trash and rubbish complaints. We have excessive vegetation, open storage, non-operable vehicles, and then we also have 27 proactive officer investigations. This report is able to identify the service requests and break it down by district. And then not only that, it's able to break it down by the top three complaints per district, as you see on the right-hand side. We have received uh, tremendous feedback with this. We have received uh, citizens that said that they are proud um, to be an Independence resident that they're able to have a voice again, that we were able to fill some potholes within 24 hours of them being able to submit it. And I do have to recognize our incredible tech services team. They have done a phenomenal job over the course of the last six months. There is nothing that Mr. City Manager nor myself have thrown at them that they haven't been able to produce um, when it comes to this. They have been a tremendous help with this. Um, and so, as you can tell with, the, with this data uh, in moving forward, these numbers are gonna change. Unfortunately, as we get into the winter months and snow is fast approaching, we're gonna see some changes with our, our top um, service request, that being you know, snow, snow removal and, um, and that type of thing. But this gives us a, a kind of a 30 foot overview as to where we need to focus our resources um, and be able to move, move accordingly. So with that, I will take any questions that you may have. Assume I don't know what I'm doing on a computer okay. so that I would make a complaint. Can I call? Absolutely. So uh, one of the four areas that we, let me get back to it. One of the very, um, the back to basics, one of the, the four components of that is being able to call in to our community affairs executive assistant. Uh, and she, she can be reached um, at 816-325-7027, or you do have the ability of coming up to City Hall. Uh, again, one of, one of the great reasons um, implementing this system has given us the ability, if you come to City Hall and you go up to the community development counter or you come up to the third floor, regardless of who you speak with, we are able to put in your concern and your complaint into the system and be able to um, push it to the correct department. One problem we used to have before yeah. you came, we had to know the address. Mm -hmm. I need to have the specific address. It drove me nuts. I know it's on 23rd Street and Nolan and it's the southeast corner. Not good enough. I had to physically go and get a silly address in order to make that phone call to have something done. Have we changed that? We sure have. So Tech Services has, again, done a phenomenal job. We're able to put intersections into our system, be able to geo-verify it, and we're able to send staff out and let them know. We're also able to add notes to it. So if you've provided an address to me, or you've provided an intersection or a general area, I can add notes that, you know, Ms. Jalucci specifically requested that this be addressed in this area or the concern is next to this particular power box, if you will. So we're, we're able to give very uh, finite detail to both our, our citizens but also um, our internal staff to Thank fix that. Thank you so much. That matters yes. a lot. Thank you. Any other questions? Real quick. Do you guys... Um, when you do the automatic notification when the case closes? Yes, sir. Is that followed up? Do you guys do an automatic survey then to the citizens by any chance? So we're in the process of implementing that. Uh, we do reach out to certain citizens. Um, we have discussed it internally that we want to try and do that, you know, for every 100 SRs, because as you can tell, we, we do get a tremendous amount um, every oh, yeah. single day that come through. But, you know, within, you know, the one in every 100 or one in every 200 or something like that, one in every 50, we do want to send out um, a survey that allows them to tell us and give us some feedback on that. I, you know, I'd like to see a lot of apps now just have a five-star rating system and mm -hmm. they'll have three or four questions you can click through just real quick. Yes. Uh, if that's, I'll, 
Did I see Jason walk in here earlier? Yes, sir. I know he can he can get that program in about thirty minutes. Forty five yeah. minutes. So, and that's actually anyway. exactly what we were talking about doing was was the five star with some additional comments. Yeah, right. And most people aren't going to type comments in. Some will, some won't. But I, you know, uh, surveys are now the the hip new thing in data collection. So it'd be nice to see. Ultimately. Absolutely. Anyway, we'll take that's that back. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. One Thank question you. for you. Yes, sir. So. Miranda sends out like the dangers of building report and the project list report. Is it possible to have maybe for the month what our top three were? I'm pretty sure mine will not change much, but it would still be kind of nice to see what that looks like. Would that be some sent out monthly? So we're currently in the beginning phases of we of being able to do that. So we're not quite ready to be able to do that just okay. yet, uh, but that is definitely something that is coming probably in, in early of 22. And council member, if I can add to that, please. Um, if you're like me, the last thing you need is another email. And, and staff does a great job putting these reports together, but you get a dangerous building report and a building permit report and a property may, and, 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 and. What Meg and her team in the communications <laughs> office is working on is summarizing all of that into yeah. one report that can go both to you as a council, but also to the public, so they can see what's what's happened at City Hall this past week. What's going on instead of these segregated reports that are valuable, but you know sometimes hard to keep up with when you're getting that many at once. Sure, ab absolutely. And there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to property maintenance codes and and public health and things like that. And the dangerous building list is long, and in, and buildings are in various stages of rectifying their, their situation so however you can condense down and um, streamline that would be awesome anything else oh that just made me think of something that would be pretty handy to have the back-end database where if you look somebody up or some property up that you could get a comprehensive view is that the goal it, it is and you know if you hit the back button um, I'm not technology savvy either um, the district breakdown list that goes to exactly what you're talking about, Council Member. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't a, a contest of who turned the most cases in. This is a... Well, for some it is. It may, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> this, this may be... Yeah. What, what we intend to use this for is exactly that. I mean, number one, case history, but two, forward thinking of where are yeah. the requests coming in the city and what kind of requests. So instead of just dividing by four, dividing by whatever number, no, let's move these resources to where the demands for services are at so that we can proactively target and, and tackle and anticipate these things. Well, so long as Mr. Newkirk's here, it might be nice to have a database that, uh, that, that uh, can, can stick the crime data in there too. We have for uh, fire and police public safety calls too. It might be interesting to see how some of that information correlates uh, you know, codes, calls, crime, that kind of stuff. Yes, yeah, so that is actually part of the back to basics uh, that we're report that we're working on. Where we're going to go through each department and we're going to select some uh, very specific information, such as that, to be able to provide on this on this report. So it it is definitely coming in the future. Sounds to me like you might be trying to build a case for a geo bond. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, just right now, honestly, our priority is to make sure that um, we respond to these requests for services as quickly as possible, but also give you as a council data so that when you're contemplating things like the annual budget, you can make those decisions about what resources need to be allocated where to match those requests for service. And I will also say, um, you know, as Sam's alluded to, this is still a rollout. We're working on this. Um, you know, we are going to be tracking not just the static numbers of how many, but also how well. T you, know what else, you know what else would be nice to see in there is uh, rental properties versus um, versus homeowners. Uh, you know, anything that gives you a more granular look at what styles of pro, you know, what styles of all the demographics that may be, yeah. you know, you, right. you could really get pretty granular and it might be a good way to target dollars. That's that's the end game. That's here, the end game, is, yeah. is to try to proactively anticipate where the need is at um, so that we can allocate dollars and people to where the need is at. 
Okay, thank you. I well, like it. I would add that our community development people work their butts off to, to do the whole aspect of, of everything they do now. They're from, from zoning to industrial industries and all of that to our code enforcement officers. That uh, retirement stopped in and said hi real fast to Amanda, who is retired. So as long as we yes. keep good people in there, even, we're losing some to retirement, so we need to get some good people to fill those shoes that are um, that are leaving. Absolutely, yeah. They have been tremendous to work with, and, and like the uh, graph here shows, I mean, of the 576 brand new service requests, they're they're receiving s almost 60 percent of them. So, right. yeah, they definitely take a large chunk of this. Well, let us know if you guys need anything. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Very, very much. Staff reports, COVID-19 vaccine rate analysis, Mr. City Manager. Yes, uh, again, uh, Council, tonight we're going to give you a presentation that is simply, again, data-driven to show you um, where and how many people in your community have received the vaccination. This isn't intended to advocate for or against the vaccine, but it's simply um, as we continue to work our way through um, the pandemic as the age 5 to 11 cohort has now been authorized to receive the vaccine. Um, we wanted to provide you some information uh, that our health department is using to understand again where and how many people in the community have been vaccinated. Presentation is going to come to you from Vanessa. Vanessa works in the technology services division of our um, uh, finance and administration department. Um, they house the GIS data and mapping function in there. Christina Heinen, our health director, is here to answer specific health-related questions that you have, but when it comes to data and statistics, uh, Vanessa is your person. So I tried to filibuster as long as I could, Meg, but ran out of things to say. Good evening, Chairman and Council Members. Thank you for the opportunity to present this evening. My name is Vanessa Kerner. I'm the IT manager over the CityWorks GIS team. Uh, for those of you that don't know, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems, maps, any kind of uh, data and analytics, we're your shop. Back in August, the CityWorks GIS team was contacted about mapping COVID vaccination data so city management and the health department could visually assess vaccination rates across the city. The goal was to identify geographic areas where vaccination rates were lower and to develop targeted strategies to engage those areas based on socioeconomic factors. Using GIS, we were able to append over 42,000 records to zip code polygons for analysis. By doing so, we were able to calculate the vaccination rate by zip code, identify priority populations, and identify underserved areas. Our first map shows the vaccination rate expressed as a percentage of the total population the dark green areas represent areas with a lower percentage of a vaccination rate, where the light green areas have a higher percentage. To identify our priority populations, we use pre-identified variables through our GIS software. Those include the population is 65 and older, households below poverty level, black population, Hispanic population, Pacific Islander population, and education, those age 25 and older with some high school but no diploma. The dark blue areas represent a higher concentration of at-risk areas where the light blue is a lower risk. Using both of those previous maps, we're able to determine our underserved areas. Those look at areas with low vaccination rates and high counts of priority populations. The dark blue areas have higher concentrations of underserved populations and the light blue have lower concentrations. For each one of our zip codes, we're able to look at the tapestry segmentation. The tapestry segmentation is a, pro is a uh, product of our GIS software. 
It consolidates numerous data sources to give you a, a, an overview of the area. So the tapestry segmentation can help create a vision for our marketing strategy by breaking the city into demographic and socioeconomic segments. And I am going to skip through all of these, but each one of these uh, zip codes have a link to the tapestry segmentation that corresponds to that zip code. When we analyzed the geographic availability of vaccination sites, we found that almost almost all of Independence could be reached could reach a vaccination site within a 15 minute drive. Once once we determined that geographic availability was not a concern, we moved on to analyze the persons of Independence. We broke down all at on all unvaccinated persons into groups, into five groups, those who are vaccine resistant, those with medical exemptions, children, vaccine hesitancy, and those with access restrictions. We determined that we could only impact two of those groups, those with vaccine hesitancy and those with access restrictions. Think micro to go macro, from small to big. At the micro level, we can use media and outreach campaigns to target barriers to vaccination. At the mezzo or large group level, we have ISD doing parent outreach via text and calls and door-to-door -door public health campaigns, uh, outreach that includes homebound individuals and homeless encampments. At the macro level, the large scale community, we can use campaigns targeting young people and also go hyper-local and population specific. Uh, some of our research found that women control more than 80% of healthcare decisions within the family. So we could look at implications of fertility, pregnancy, and breast, breastfeeding. Looking back to the micro levels at the individual level, we looked at the influenza vaccine, where there are psychological barriers such as utility. Is it more beneficial or is it more risky? The attitude, past behavior, and moving on to contextual barriers they did not receive a direct recommendation from medical personnel. By using GIS analysis, we were able to identify geographic areas within the city with lower vaccination rates, identify demographics using the tapestry segmentation, and develop an outreach campaign strategy to impact our community. Are there any questions at this point? Any questions from the council? It is interesting. Hearing none, I do have one. I hadn't really thought about it until now. So I was vaccinated at my work in Kansas City. So would would my vaccination re reflect itself here in Independence? So yes, um, we pulled all the files from Show Me Vax, and we pulled them at a zip code level because that is what we would be able to access. Um, even for those that we didn't personally vaccinate. So yes, it pulls for all of our residents, regardless of where they were vaccinated, as long as their vaccination was entered into Show Me Vax. There are some exceptions, um, some who received their vaccine through the federal government, whether they are uh, military or some different locations um, did receive directly from the federal government, like CVS received some of their initial uh, long-term care facilities for that, that initial drive. Those may not be reflected in Show Me Vax. Some are, some aren't. So for my case, I was vaccinated at my store at the pharmacy. Typically, would they put that information into the Show Me Vax? I can, since I'm not familiar with that pharmacy specifically, I couldn't tell you. It depends on where they would get it from. If they had it shipped through the state, they would have been required to. Gotcha. Um, so depending on where they got it, most, it, they try to. So I know many high V locations, many price chopper locations, all of those do still enter ultimately into Show Me Vax. What do you think the plus or minus is on accuracy for this? Well, um, the state admits that they do have some issues that they've been working through, um, which they feel comfortable saying that there's a plus or minus 2% on their accuracy. Um, without really knowing how many were vaccinated through the military, it's really hard to know. Sure, no, fair enough. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the presentation. Any, any other questions, thoughts? 
Very yeah. fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, very much so. Really? Thank you, Vincent. You're Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes our topics this evening. Unless anyone else has any discussions to bring up, Mr. City Manager? Nothing further. We will conclude this evening's meeting. Thank you.